Well, welcome to our internet service here at Hope Church Leeds. Great you could join us. We're really looking forward to our time together. We're going to spend some time in worship and praise, in prayer, and then opening God's word together. Oh, 
hungry thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God sing. How great thou art Well, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Lord God, we want to bow before you and we want to give you all the honour and praise that is due your great and holy name. You are our creator and we thank you. We praise you that you have made us to know you and to love you. Thank you for this world that you've created and although it's a world that has been spoilt by sin, nevertheless, Lord, we see your splendour, your majesty in it. Lord, thank you for the way that you provide for us through your creation. Thank you that you rule over your creation. Thank you that you sustain your creation, that uh, by the word of your power, the very atoms hold together. And Lord, we want to thank you for giving us life. Thank you for the breath that you've placed in our body. Thank you for all the things that we enjoy. We thank you for food, for clothing, for housing, for family, for friends. And we thank you, Lord, as well, for placing us in the family of your people. Thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy with fellow believers. And Lord, we want to acknowledge before you that we haven't treated you or your world as we should have. We are conscious, Lord, that we live in a world that, although you made perfect, has been ruined by sin. And Lord, we own our own responsibility We know that we are all sinners before you. But Lord, we thank you that you're not only our creator, but you're also our our redeemer. Thank you that you did not leave us in our sin. You did not treat us as our sins deserve, but rather you came in love. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you that through his great sacrifice, we find life and new life and eternal life. So Lord, we want to give you thanks and praise. We thank you for the God that you are. And now Lord, we commit our time into your hands and we pray that our time together 
um, would be good. We pray that you'd speak to us through your word. We lift before you all those in our fellowship who have special needs at this time. We pray for those who are physically not well at the moment or are in a state where they are recovering from illness. Lord, we pray that you would be near to them and sustain and help them. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you now and we give you thanks and honour and praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. From the chaos of darkness, your word shaped the earth in your image of Well, this week we're going to start a new mini-series entitled How Great Is Our God? Cam's going to bring us our reading for today. It's Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 verses 12 to 31. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord? or instruct the Lord as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him, and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge, or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. 
Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom, then, will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions a silver chain for it. A person too poor pr to present such an offering selects a wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set, an, set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows them off and they wither, and whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens, who created all these. He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will talk and not be faint. Ways to 
This is how one astronomer explained why she was so obsessed with astronomy. Astronomy is simple yet complex, serene yet explosive, lucid but nebulous, romantic yet scientific, expansive yet precise. Astronomy is an eight minute solar trip or a journey into light years. Astronomy makes me feel like I'm on a rocket ship of discovery. Nothing else quite makes it. Another astronomer put it like this. A telescope changed everything for me. Seeing the universe with your own eyes creates an overwhelming flood of passion for more. Now, I want to ask a question this morning. Are you as excited about God as those astronomers are about astronomy? Because we should be. You see, as amazing and awe-inspiring as space is, it is nothing compared with the God who put it there. As we read today in our passage in Isaiah 40, it's God who brings out the starry hosts one by one. He calls forth each of them by name, or he stretches out the heavens like a canopy. You know, the Bible takes us on a rocket ship of discovery into who God is, and nothing compares with that. When you begin to see God for who he is, there should, as, as that astronomer put it, be an overwhelming flood of passion for more. We sometimes call the study of God theology. Now, I think that sounds a bit dry and dusty, to be honest, but it never should be, you know. You study the stars, you might become an astronomer. But by studying God, you become a worshipper. In other words, it moves you, it touches you, it's personal. And the wonderful thing is that the God who made all of this, made the cosmos, is the God that you can be personally connected to. And he can change and transform your life. So we're going to start this mini-series, How Great Is Our God? It's a mini-series with a massive subject. So we're hardly going to scratch the surface. We're just going to, as it were, dip our toe in the water. This morning, we're going to begin by thinking about the bigness of God. Do you know, maybe one of the, the great tragedies of our age, I'm not just talking about secular society now, I mean the church as well, that we have lost this sense of the bigness of God. The Bible is full of passages about the greatness and majesty of God. And this morning, we're just looking at one of those passages, Isaiah 40. Right at the end there, there's a very well-known verse. It says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I think that verse is on uh, many Christians' list of favourite Bible texts. You might even have seen it on a poster, perhaps with a picture of an eagle flying over a mountain. And they are wonderful words. It's a fantastic promise. But I think to understand them, fully, properly, you need to see the context they were written into. So to get the context, I think verse 27 is really helpful. So verse 27 of Isaiah 40 says this, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? So this is the people of God, the Jews speaking, and they're in exile in Babylon, and they're feeling utterly despondent and forgotten by God. In fact, Isaiah writes this prophecy 200 years before the exile even happened. It's amazing how God gives him this prophetic glimpse into what the people would feel. In fact, in the previous chapter, he's prophesied the exile itself. So in Isaiah 39, verse 6, we read this. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left says the Lord. And in 568 BC, that's exactly what happened. Babylon, the world superpower, steamrolled through Israel, arrived at Jerusalem, leveled the walls, destroyed the temple and carted off many of the inhabitants, hundreds of miles back to Babylon, where they were to live in exile. The whole experience would have been utterly shattering. They faced a bleak future with very, very little hope. Now, I think in many ways we can empathise with their feelings at a time like this. Maybe you felt a sense of 
despondency, even despair. Perhaps you've even felt abandoned. Maybe you've felt this sense of being overpowered by forces that are bigger than you. You're powerless to resist. And maybe you felt all I can do is just sit around and wait for events to run their course. We're facing tough times, aren't we, as a, as a nation. The coronavirus has caused so much hurt and pain and suffering. And now, of course, we've got the economic downturn, a lack of job security, unemployment for so many. But, you know, it's not just the physical or economic state of the nation. It's the spiritual state of the nation, too. You know, we are in a mess. Apathy to Christian truth has now become antagonism to Christian truth. Seems that even at a government level, every moral, every value of God's word has been trampled underfoot. I noticed even last week that the government have said they're going to ban anyone who wants to counsel people out of same-sex attraction. So people who want help, well, it will be illegal for them to seek it or for you to give it. You can just feel powerless, can't you, in the face of all of this? And it's not just on a national level, it's a personal level too, isn't it? Maybe you individually have been facing really tough times and perhaps you've even wondered if God's abandoned you. So as we look at what God had to say through the prophet Isaiah in the mid-6th century BC, I think there's a really important message for us here too. And the message of Isaiah is the message about the majesty of God. A God who is more than adequate to meet your needs. So first of all, he talks about the God of creation. God the creator, verses 12 to 20. And he's using poetic language here to describe the bigness of God. So verse 12, he says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Speaking of God. So the waters here are, are the seas and the oceans. And they are vast, aren't they? I don't know if you've ever flown across the Atlantic or maybe even the Pacific. And for hour after hour, mile after mile, it's just water. It's all you can see. And we know, don't we, that the waters cover three quarters of the world's surface. At some points, it's really deep. So the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean is 36,201 feet deep. We're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of gallons of water. And yet, what does Isaiah say? He says, God measures it in the hollow of his hand. You get the point, don't you? He's a big God. And then he continues in, in verse 12. God, with the breadth of his hand, marked off the heavens. So the heavens here are the stars, the cosmos. Modern science is helping us to understand how vast it really is. So the nearest star to planet Earth is Proxima Centauri. It's 4.2 light years away. Doesn't sound very far, does it? Until you realise that that is the distance that light travels in 4.2 years. And light travels at 186,000 miles per second. Which means that Proxima Centauri is 21 billion 556,927,570 miles away. But that's just 4.2 light years away. The star that, the furthest star that we can see from Earth is 13.8 billion light years away. That is the distance that light can travel in 13.8 billion years. And the current thinking is that the universe is 93 billion light years in diameter. I mean, it's bigger than you can comprehend, isn't it? And yet, what does Isaiah say? Well, he measures the distance with just the breadth of his hand. He's a big God. An atheistic astronomer was talking to a young Christian and just dismissing his belief in God. And he said rather disparagingly, when I think of Jesus, I think of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And the young Christian thought for a while and he said, well, when I think of astronomy, I think of twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> you know, compared with God, it really is twinkle, twinkle, little star, isn't it? God is big. And then Isaiah goes on in verse 12, who has held the dust of the earth in a basket. 
That is all the soil and the rock and the sand that makes up planet Earth. Well, God just carries it, as it were, in a bucket. Like you might carry, you know, some soil for the garden. And he continues, God has weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance. We've enjoyed a number of holidays in, in the Alps and they are amazing. Just so vast. You don't notice it until you see a plane flying in the distance in front of a mountain. It just looks like a toy. And yet, the Himalayas make the Alps look puny. And yet, what does it say here? God weighs them on a scale. Just like you might weigh flour for baking. It's poetic language, isn't it? But it's giving us the impression. Listen, he's a big God. And he's not also great, he's not just great in his work, but he's also great in his wisdom. So look at verse 13. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Who taught him the right way? I don't know if you've ever had to build flat pack furniture. I, I built some just last week. It was a, a Billy bookcase. And uh, you know how it is. If you're a fella, you get all the bits out of the box and you just dive straight in, you start assembling it. And then about half an hour later, when the shelves the wrong way round, you disassemble it all. You look at the instructions and you do it properly. <laughs> Listen, when God made the universe, when he made the cosmos, he didn't have to consult anyone, did he? He didn't need instructions to get it right. No, he is an all wise God, supremely wise. He's unrivaled, says Isaiah, in both his power and his wisdom. And he's greater than anything. He's greater than the nations. So, read there in verse 15. Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless, less than nothing. When Isaiah wrote, of course, the superpower of the day was Babylon. Babylon with its unstoppable armies. But there were other powers too, like Egypt and Assyria. But from God's perspective, he says they are nothing. They're insignificant. A drop in a bucket, dust on the scales. That was important for the Jews to hear, wasn't it? Because there they were, they'd been conquered by Babylon and now they're in exile in Babylon and Babylon must have seemed so impressive, so great, but from God's perspective, puny. And the same is true today, whether it be Russia or the USA or China, past and present, all nations are nothing compared to him. He's a big God. And then he's greater than the false gods too. Verse 18, with whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Of course, the reason that the Jews were in exile was because they turned to idols instead of worshipping the true and living God. And so God had had to judge them. Babylon, where they were now living, was, was full of temples that were full of idols. And yet, as God points out here, they're nothing. They, they, you have to help them to stand up. How pathetic. And we worship pathetic idols today, today don't we? The idols of, of sex and money and power. And they're nothing compared with God. Who is really in charge? Who is dictating events? Well, the next thing Isaiah talks about is God the ruler, verses 21 to 26. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy. He spreads them out like a tent to live in. God is enthroned over the earth, says Isaiah, and it's been true since the beginning of creation. God has always ruled, and he rules not as some constitutional monarch. He's in charge. 
And look at what it says here. The people are like grasshoppers. Small, squeaky things that jump up and down. Someone said a great definition of Prime Minister's Question Time. Look at us, we're, we're so full of ourselves, aren't we? We think we're so big and powerful, and particularly if you've got a position of authority. And yet the truth is, we are really, really small compared with God. We're like grasshoppers. No, he's in control. You can see how reassuring that was for the Israelites, can't you? Despite your exile, despite all you've been through, remember, God is still on the throne. Do you remember the Italian cruise liner that uh, sank off the coast of a, a Tuscan island? It was back in 2012. 32 people died. And do you remember the great scandal of it? The Italian captain apparently had left the sinking ship before many of the passengers. And it caused outrage. He was the captain. He was meant to stay to look after the safety of his passengers and crew. And yet he abandoned the vessel. Listen, God is not that kind of captain. He is the captain of this ship of history. And he never leaves the bridge. And he never loses control of the vessel either. He is God, he's ruling over the world. And that means he's ruling over coronavirus. He's ruling over all of that which is going on in our society. And God rules over all the princes and rulers too. Look at verse 23. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and the whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. Nebuchadnezzar will one day be gone, God says to the Israelites. And so will Putin and so will Trump one day. All these great leaders, they come and they go and God, as it were, blows them away like leaves in the autumn. You see, God decides what happens. He is sovereign. He's ruling. Notice verse 27, uh, verse 25 rather. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Lord? Lift up your eyes, look at the heavens. Who created all these things? Who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them all by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why was that so significant for the Jews? Well, it was significant because astrology was a massive part of religion in Babylon. They believed the stars dictated and determined the events and, and outcomes. A bit like some people do today. They, they read their horoscope. Well, that was central to religious belief in Babylon. But look at what the prophet says. The stars that you think are controlling you are really controlled by God. He calls them out by name, just like you might call a dog to heal. You know, here boy. God controls them all. And of course, he created them all. God is in charge. Listen, everything and everyone is dwarfed by God. It's a bit like putting my garden shed, all seven foot of it, alongside the Burf Khalifa, the world's largest building in Dubai. It's 2,716 feet tall and it dwarfs everything. And it's a bit like the greatest thing that you can think of, even the cosmos, the universe. It's just a garden shed compared with, with the Burf Khalifa when you compare us with God. Everything is dwarfed by God. He's a big God. And so that brings us to the final point that Isaiah makes. He talks about God the sustainer, verses 27 to 31. And he talks about this complaint that the, the Israelites had, that they've been abandoned by God. And God says there in verse 28, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. 
they will walk and not be faint. You know, often our faith is weak, just like the Israelites. Often our strength is weak. And it's so easy just to give up, isn't it? I don't know if you remember the picture of Paula Radcliffe, one of Britain's finest athletes. She was sat in the gutter on an Athens street after giving up in the Olympic marathon. She'd gone 22 miles and she just couldn't go on any further. And spiritually, no, that can happen to us too. That's why it says, verse 30, even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. In other words, even the ones that you would expect to have those reserves of strength grow weak. Don't think it can't happen to you. Even though you've been a Christian for many, many years, you, you can stumble and fall. And that is why we need this vision of the greatness, the majesty of God. We need reminding that he's the God who made the world. He is a big God who rules over the world and he's the one who will not grow tired and weary. He's never out of his depth. He's always able to deal with every situation we face. He's always wise. His plans are always right. He's always able and willing to meet us at our point of need. And he's ready to strengthen us and lift us up. It's a very powerful image of the eagle, isn't it? A majestic sight when you see an eagle soaring through the sky. I've seen it once or twice, maybe not as close as that picture, but you see the picture, don't you? You see the image. Actually, it would have resonated with the Israelites. In Exodus 19 and verse 4, when God brought them out of Egypt, he says, you yourselves have seen how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you back to myself. And God is saying to the people of Israel here in exile, just as I carried you on eagle's wings out of Egypt and to the promised land, I'm going to carry you as well out of exile and back to Israel. A weary and a broken people, beaten by sin, beaten by the enemy and by circumstances. But they're going to be brought back by God. And can I say to you today, God wants to do the same for you. He really does. He wants to take you weak and feeble as you are. And he wants to give you his strength. He wants to give you a, a, a divine, a, a heavenly ability that is not yours to live for him. That is why you can face the future. That is why you can get through these difficult times. That is why you can live for God in this world. Because he is with you. And he is within you. See, we know now, don't we, that because of Jesus, it's possible to be forgiven and to be cleansed from sin. It's possible for God to come and live within us by his spirit, transform us and change us. And Jesus wants to do that for you right now, today. Listen, if you're a Christian, get your eyes fixed on who God is. Remember how great he is. Remember the bigness of God. And then put your trust in him. Call out to him. And he's waiting and willing to do for you what he wanted to do for the Israelites. He will enable you to soar instead of stumble He'll enable you to keep going instead of giving up. He will renew your strength. What a wonderful promise. May each of us know that in our lives and experience, day by day, in the coming days, in the coming weeks and months, as we face challenges of all kinds, we can come to this God and find the strength that we need. He is able. He's a big God. Amen.
Once again, we've come to the end of our service. Thank you for joining us. We trust that it's blessed you and helped you. We'll be back again next week. But let's close our time now in a word of prayer. But those who trust in the Lord for help will find strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. Dear God, we do pray that you would indeed renew our strength. We trust in you alone, Lord. We trust you to give us the strength to walk the path that you've set for us this week. And Lord, though it may be hard and narrow and winding, we thank you that you are with us and beside us and that you can enable us to walk that path. Lord, we pray that each of us might know your sustaining grace, your power, your strength in the midst of our weakness. And Lord, we ask that our lives might bring great glory to your name. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.